Hi, Book Club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 51, and our book is Aramen Exile, the first book in the Aramen trilogy. <laughs> Only we would buy an omnibus to then break it up into small pieces by Jonathan French. This is the beginning be of fair, the... They don't sell the individual books anymore. <laughs> to be fair... Um, this is the first in the adventures of Aramen, bridging between the 30th and the 41st millennium. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our discussions via Twitter, YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Vox channel. Spoiler warning, if you somehow haven't read this book in the nine years since it originally published, go ahead and check out the book and our post, and then come back to this video as we'll be talking all the spoilers. All of them. Not that we're night. judging you for not reading it, because obviously we hadn't read it either. Right. I tend I tend to assume, though, like, if I'm coming to something for the first time, like, everybody else and their brother has already read it. Like, I just, I just kind of make that assumption with a lot of the books that we've read, and I'm actually really surprised. And you're right, I really shouldn't. Because, like, when we read um, the ADB Grey Knights book. Oh, um... Emperor's Gift. Emperor's Gift. Um, when we read that one, I was surprised at the number of people who were like, oh, this has been on my backlog list. And I was like, you and us. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've been considering breaking, diving into the omnibus, first I feel as though we should make a slight preface and say, we are breaking up the omnibus into books because if we learned nothing from the fabulous Bill experiment <laughs> last year, it is that we do not want to overdose. <laughs> on an author or a character so we'll be kind of sparsing it out over the next few months unless which it's, unless it's your old ventress because i did that no problem can you od on uriel no 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 if anything there's never enough um yes that's okay that's that's a that's an exception um some books i feel Let's start with the classic. Did you like this book? It was okay. I mean, I didn't hate it. Um, there are parts of it I liked. Unfortunately, this was a lot like Spear of the Emperor to me. And that it just took... Some parts of the beginning were good, but it wasn't until about page 200. I was like, oh... Now we have stuff going on. And I think it's because this book was just, it's unfortunate that it was just one of those, you could just see how it was just setting up a chessboard. Yes. I did not like this book. And I am so not shocked. About halfway through, it was like, Jen's going to hate this book. So let me preface this with two. First off, I think it's really important to know that if I haven't mentioned this, or if you haven't heard an episode where I mentioned this, I do not like the Thousand Sons at all. I got no sympathy for these people. Um, I'll talk more about that in a second because there's kind of a fine line that I walk with Armin, but uh, I just don't like the Thousand Sons. So I went into this one curious, but now I know that Fabulous Bill came out much after this book did. However, do you remember when they, the Tomb Raider reboot came out, like in 2014 or 15, mm -hmm. and everybody was like, ugh, it's an Uncharted clone. Ugh, which pissed me off. I know, right? Because on one hand, you're like, uh, yeah, Uncharted was a Tomb Raider clone, friends. Uh, see also the Constantine t TV show where everybody was like, it's a supernatural clone. And I was like, excuse you. John Constantine is the OG Demon Hunter. However, and, an entire generation. And Tomb Raider... Raider was actually the female version of Indiana Jones. So we can just keep exactly. on going. We can just keep pulling that little thread. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, an entire generation had grown up playing Uncharted. So when Tomb Raider came out, it was like, oh, this is just more of that. I know that this came before the first Fabulous Bill book, but because we had the misfortune, or like I mean, for this particular book, because we had already read Fabulous Bill, it was like trying to watch an author do the same magic trick where I was like, oh, I've already seen this trick. I made no parallels between the two. 
talk more about that in a minute. Um, so let's start off with what, what parts did stand out to you? Because you mentioned especially that you did like several parts of it. So the one that really stood out pretty early on is when, is when Tolbeck shows up. And he then he recognizes Ariman, and Ariman just lets loose, and suddenly everybody is a puddle of goo in less than five seconds. And I was like, "Oh my god! Like, you can be seriously scary when when you want to be." Um, right. Yeah, here he was acting this meek guy this entire time because he just wanted to be left alone, and it's like, "Oh no, they found me! Everybody dies." You know, it's kind of like me playing stealth games. I get spotted. Shame. You're all going to die, Shame. man. <laughs> but just like... I, how, I like that scene as well. Just because it was, it was kind of out of the blue. And it's very descriptive. And it really kind of showed really how powerful Ariman was. And that was actually the very first time like I understood why... The Thousand Sons were called sorcerers instead of like librarians. Right. Or psychers or something as Yes. Something as pedestrian as Psyker. Right, because I mean they all were psychers. Mm -hmm. Um but they have And yet <laughs> they just have this grasp on warp wielding that is just so far and beyond what anybody else can do. And uh you know, it kind of reminds me a lot. You now, I actually had a lot of Dragon Age parallels in this. It made me think a lot of the mages, you know, how they're restricted. And it's kind of what the emperor was trying to do. He was trying to, you know, put them all in circles and say, you can't do this stuff because they were getting too powerful. And everyone gets afraid when, you know, if you've played any Dragon Age game, they always get afraid when mage gets too powerful because there's always that risk that they're going to tip into the veil and become an abomination. It's, I mean... Tell me that the Dragon Age people didn't read this stuff before. I, I dare you. Uh, yeah. Uh, because it's very much the same thing. But if you know too much, much, you're going to go, you're going to get warped and tainted. Mm -hmm. And I just found it just so interesting how powerful Ariman is. And he's even been in the planet of the sorcerers, yet he hadn't mutated. And he was, and he renounced all chaos. Like he was just like, this is bad. What we are doing is awful and at this and he knows it and at the same time he can't stop doing it so it's just right yeah it's it's such an interesting dichotomy with him uh just unfortunately he got a little too emo for my tastes at at a lot of it yeah so I liked that scene as well because I like a good tense scene. And when Tolbeck kind of comes in there and is just like, no, you guys are all a joke. I'm leaving. Peace. And he turns to leave and Aramin's just sitting there like, okay, good. And then Tolbeck stops. And Aramin is like, here we go. <laughs> like, I really did like how he wasn't like, he didn't freak out or anything like mm -hmm. that. He was just like, Okay. <laughs> and I did like that when Tolbeck just kind of like is like who are you and he's like come on brother like that I did like there was I liked that whole scene and I liked the way it handled and I did like I'll get into this in a second I did like where Armin is just like like again with the magic it just comes out right mm -hmm. um I didn't like how didn't like how reluctant he was to like use his sorcerer powers especially because we know like i don't like that kind of stuff because it was like we know that you dip back into it okay we know what you've been doing for the last ten thousand years mm -hmm. so cut to the chase but i did like how he's just like uh, <laughs> there was there was kind of a tone of still got it like kind of self-effacing but also right kind of like well, this is the moment it was, it was just like wow he had forgotten how powerful he was then he's just like oh god i shouldn't have done that you know it's it's almost like he was trying to okay make a reference here that i know you're gonna hate but uh star wars episode eight uh at one point 
uh, Ray calls out Luke. She's like, you cut yourself off from the force. And I feel that that's what Ariman did. He was so ashamed of his failure with the, with the rubric. They just kind of cut himself off. Like there's always like a little bit of the warp, but he just stopped practicing entirely and was just like, I just want another day to survive and move on and just be a nobody. And it's like, well, when I have to, it can come. Then it's immediately like, oh crap, now they're all going to find me. I basically sent this big old flare <laughs> in the eye. Pretty much, right? Well, right. Like I do... I do like to imagine as soon as he did that, I heard the sound effect for if you ever played the Metal Gear games when you got seen. <laughs> <laughs> like, totally imagined red exclamation point above his head, right? It's like, oh, you. That, I thought. I just, I really liked that concept. I also really liked, I can never remember what her name was. The tech priestess. Carmenta? Carmenta. Um, the tech witch um i actually kind of liked her she she was a little annoying in places um but i did like her overall concept mm -hmm. right so that actually really stood out to me i one of the things that i really struggled with is that this kind of bridges into our next question of whether or not you like Araman as a character i really don't like him as a character and one of the things i struggled with in this book is that i also hated fabulous bill as a character but I loved all the people with whom he associated, right? So, like, I really loved Ar Arian. I almost said Araman. <laughs> Arian, and I loved Korag, and I loved, um, I cannot think of his name right now, but it was the word bearer. I actually really liked the word bearer. Oh, I don't remember his name uh, either, but yeah. Yeah, it had a Q in it. I remember that. Um, I didn't really like the people that Araman was surrounded with, but I did like Carmenta. She was, she was kind of fun. Um, there's always this interesting gray area in the Warhammer 40k universe, right? Where you have the traitors and you have the loyalists and then there's this kind of weird gray renegade area, mm -hmm. right? Where I'm definitely not doing what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not full-blown chaos yet. No, we're not worshipping the chaos gods. We're just not buying what the Emperor is selling anymore either. And I feel as though, I feel as though the Mechanicus, more than any other faction, is really ripe for that, right? Where it's like, well, we don't want to, like, create demon engines, but we really don't like some of the restrictions that have been placed on us. Like, I, I feel as though if anybody, like, if anybody has a really strong pull to the gray area, it's probably them. So... Her whole character arc, I like. Or, like, her concept, I like. There were some scenes where I was, like... Actually, in the end, I was kind of like, eh, just... Do you really need her? I mean, kind of not. I mean... It was like... When he... Yeah, when he brings her... Anyways. um, But did you like Armin as a character in this? Yeah, I do. But I like... But, you know, I liked him in a Thousand Sons mm -hmm. as well. Like, I cheered when he ripped that one rune priest's soul out, you know, and threw it into the warp. And, like, I knew he was, like, one of your favorite characters. I don't remember the guy's name. I just remember it was a funny name because I couldn't help but giggle every single time it popped up. I can't think of his name right now either. And I really liked him. So it's really funny to me because, obviously, in that scene... Yeah, that scene, we had different reactions to that scene. <laughs> because all like, I saw was some, this uh, space wolf that Ariman actually trusted and, like, talked to him, and this guy just fucking betrayed him. Like, wow, it's like, you couldn't even talk to me first. We just have to bring this up at the Council of Nikea. So that that's just, and so that just, because even Ariman was like, you could have talked to me. Like, we could have talked. We could have actually had a conversation. And not only that, but I just find the room priests hypocrites. Every single one of them I find to be hypocrites. Especially when they, like when they talk about librarians or the Thousand Sons, they're hypocrites. They're absolute hypocrites. So that's just kind of what made me irritated. But I liked Ariman because he was always, he was so truthful to a fault in Thousand Sons. 
And, you know, honestly, the fall, I think, broke him. Like, you know, just the look on his face when he realized what these familiars were. And he's just like, oh, my God. Like, this is so yeah. bad. We have really messed up. But why are they just killing us? Like, why can't we talk about this? That thing is like, well, you got Horace to blame for that. I can't blame the Space Wolves for all of that. That's that. That's all yeah. Horace. You know, but then he, yeah. when he, when they were playing the Sorcerers, at the end of Thousand Suns, he didn't want to be there either. He was like, this is messed up. Dad has taken us to a really bad place. Right. And so he's always just, unfortunately, Ariman is like father, like son. As he's trying to fix things, he makes things worse. And on the one hand, yes. it's kind of cringy. It's like kind of that cringy style, like, you know, cringeworthy comedy I'm not a fan of. I don't like no. it. Me either. Um, which is why I never got into Shit's Creek, even though people just love it. I just, I can't, I can't do the cringe. I just can't. Can't either. Um, it's why I'm like the only person I know who vehemently hates the movie Bridesmaids. I don't hate that movie, but there is a lot. It hits... For me, a lot of it hits really close to home with stuff. But then there's a lot of that cringe stuff. I'm just like, do we have to go this route with some of this stuff? Um, for me, I would think it's actually uh, Meet the Parents. It's my big one that whole time I was in the movie theater. I just like had my hands over my eyes because I just wanted to cry for Ben Stiller the entire movie. I just didn't find any of that funny of what happened to him. That's just how I am. Um, this is like, in a way, it's like cringe drama. Yeah. Like, it's like, you know, kind of like how I was in reading, um, you know, False Gods. It's like, it was just like, no, why are you doing this? You know, yelling at the girl running up the stairs. I was just about movie. to say, like, don't go into the attic. It's like anything that he does when he thinks he's making good decision was like, oh, pumpkin. <laughs> like, I know you think you're helping. And you're not. This is why, you know, I kind of didn't 100% blame Carmenta for betraying him. Because she saw, she's like, he's going to be the death of us all. Like, I have to stop this. Unfortunately, um, the Thousand Sons hate betrayers more than anything else. You might have missed that memo. Right. They, uh, they it, had a it's bad a, experience. It's a triggering thing to them. It's too soon. Too soon <laughs> right. to betray us again. Yeah. I so I yes. I think the thing that I don't like about Armin is that he re okay. So I we both grew up watching the Peanuts, right? Because everything's the Peanuts. I always hated the thing with Charlie Brown and Lucy with the football. Araman is the Charlie Brown of the 40k universe. Kind of is. It just makes it like, sad. How many times are you gonna trust your divine inspiration or what a demon tells you? Like, how many times are you gonna fall for this one? Um, I, I find Araman to be very tragic. There is, it, very similar to Magnus, there is a very... Mm -hmm deep and undeniable tragedy to them. I do not, however, find them sympathetic. So it, it's kind of splitting hairs, but it's an important hair to split, I think. Because I I can acknowledge that, like, okay, that's I'm sorry, that's very tragic, but I just don't feel sorry for them. I really don't have a lot of sympathy for them, because it's their own arrogance and hubris. Like, of all the characters in the 40k or actually in the 30k universe the heresy era that define hubris Araman's probably like right below his dad and you're absolutely right in a lot of ways he very much is like father like son and okay look we can sit here and talk about how you know magnus is also like his father like we can totally have that conversation like text to speech did but <laughs> like that is one of my favorite episodes, by the way, though, when he goes and gets Magnus' soul back, because he's just like, yeah. Anyways. That is I, that is one of the few I've seen, and it's a really good one. It is. Especially when he buys him a bicycle. <laughs> unfortunately, I have seen way too much text-to-speech as well, so 
Araman from Texas Beach is canon in my head. Like, the whole, like, a lot of these scenes, whenever he was dealing with the rubrics, all I could hear was, Rubrics, laugh with me! (laughs) The best thing to have in your head when you're trying to read this book. But that's the one thing about him. So it's, it's kind of, it is cringe drama to me, but it's also kind of like, it is the Charlie Brown thing. And it's, it makes me uncomfortable. Every time he's like, oh, wait, I'm not trusting demons. They're bad. Do you, you think I could reverse it? Really? Go on. Tell me more. Like, how, how many times are you going to fall for the same trick? Which I guess actually makes him the perfect follower of Zinch. Even though he's, like, not a follower. That's kind of how Zinch likes it, though. You don't even know know that you're a follower. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I did not stutter. (laughs) He says he's not, and yet I'm like... Aren't you, though? (laughs) Not on purpose, I'll say that. (laughs) He's an accidental follower. (laughs) So, one of the really interesting things about this book, and it specifically with Araman and Amon. Amon? Anyways. Um, I think specifically with those two characters, I feel as though one of the interesting themes in this book was the idea of hope and optimism. One of the things I went... I, I don't know about you, but I was actually really surprised to see how kind of optimistic Araman is. I'm not... Because that's how he always was. He yes, sees. I thought post rubric that maybe, maybe he would have lost a smidge of that. So I guess maybe I was like, oh, oh, well, good for you. You've maintained that. I mean, he sees. I mean, that I think his whole thing with as Horcus, that was his mm. depression. He was <laughs> depressed, right? And he was sad. He just needed things to go away. But then when he became Araman again, the rose-colored glasses came back on. And he was just like, you know what? Knowledge will fix all of this. And it's like, oh, pumpkin. Knowledge is what you got you here in the first place. Right. But not that black library knowledge. Although, to be fair, if anything's going to have info on how to reverse the rubricade, it's going to be the black library. I just don't think the answer's in there. I, it makes me think of this old play called, it's called uh, Sister Mary Ignatius Explains It All. And at one point, this nun is talking to these children and she's like, does God answer all prayers? Yes. But sometimes the answer is no. (laughs) Right? And uh, it goes on to be like really dark humor about like, make this cancer go away. No. Um, But that's kind of what I wanted him to get to the black library someday. And like, he finds the book and like the question is, can we reverse the rubric? A? No. You done fucked up. A. A. Ron. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. A. Aram. Oh, that actually works. A. I know. Mm-hmm. Love it. Ship it. But yeah, that's going to basically be, I, I really do want that to be the thing. Or like, he could finally find the font of wisdom. Like, he kind of found it here with the Oracle, right? But he'll find, like, the for reals, the Oracle, who's like, no. No, why would you think you could reverse that? And then I will laugh in dust. But I guess I was a little surprised by it. And I think, like, you have the, um, you have a weird sort of optimism. I guess, or Hope, I guess, is how what you would call it with Astraos and his cadre, right? Because they just, like, by God, we have given our word and we are going to stick to it. We're renegades. We're sticking to our word. Like, there was a weird... I didn't ex- I didn't go into this book expecting it to be so... I didn't expect that to be a theme. I don't know what to make of Astraos and his people because... They're renegades. Yet, yes, they they make oaths, but does it matter? I mean, in a way, and I guess it's like this is like the one thing that that we're that we're going to do. Like, I think I wrote down like one of, one of the quotes. It's like, oh, oaths did not require trust. That's the truth that the Imperium taught him. 
right? Which is so dark, but yet so true. You know, you can swear fealty, but right. it doesn't mean that you trust him at the same time, which is probably a, a pretty good way to handle the Inquisition. You know, you can, you can swear fealty to them. I wouldn't trust them. Basically defines the Inquisition in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't argue with that. Yeah. Um, that is a tr something that's becoming a trope in the 40k universe, by the way, that I really dig, though, is because we saw it also in the Talon of Horus when these heresy era marines finally interact with somewhat more modern era and they're like, what is this? Like the fact that Armin doesn't really know what the Inquisition is. That cracked right? me up. I laughed really hard because I did like that Caden and Astraos are like not these guys. <laughs> right. Armin's just like, what's an Inquisition? What's with the I and the triple bars? <laughs> yeah, like what? Like you guys are not on the level. <laughs> They're like we know. <laughs> um, I that whole but that's like becoming one of those tropes that every time I come into it I'm like it's it's just kind of fun to see how they react right to this yeah it was probably one of my favorite scenes out of Talon of Horus is when you know they find out about the god emperor and you know what's really going on outside the eye and they're just like what the hell <laughs> like, that sounds worse than how we did it how we had it you know what it is worse than how you had it you guys had it great and you done fucked it up yeah, exactly. You're the reason that they're in this. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, you are literally why we can't have nice things. Yeah, especially with the Skander Kane, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, y'all the reason we here, arguably. Um, and then we don't even talk about the word bearers. We just don't talk about that. Um, that's a but, whole other issue. That's a whole other can of worms. So I feel as though this also plays into the next question. Which is, of course, when he finally does run into Amon, and Amon has this, he has a uh, interesting solution. He has basically given up all optimism and hope, right? And is just like, screw it, we're just going to kill them all. Burn, a, burn it all them. down. Burn it down! Which, that actually, like, as much as I don't care about the Thousand Sons, I was actually really put off by that. When he explained what his plan was, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. That. It's like we just got one. It... We got one extreme in the other. We got Ariman who's confident he can save the Thousand Sons. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not the Rubrique, but he can save them from the mutations. Uh, save them from what Magnus has doomed them to. Right. And then we have Amon, who's just like, you know what? We did done fuck up AA Ron. So the only the only solution is just to finish what the Space Wolf started. Right. And I do find it interesting. So there is that there was that in that first chapter where they suggest they suggest, which is terrifying. Mm -hmm. They kind of suggest that the rubric marines are Yes, they're a shell and a mite, basically a husk trapped within there, but their soul's not entirely divorced from it. Right. Right. So, actually, I feel like that's an important conversation to have to color this next conversation. What did you make of that? Actually, it... With, what was his name? Helio... Helio something? Uh... I mean, to me, it kind of made sense just because I kind of thought that anyway with Iskander, you know, when one of his rubric, um, who he was really good friends with, who actually had like a consciousness when he died and told Iskander to get away. He's like, you need to run now, brother. And he's just like, oh, my God, you know, uh, so I always kind of felt that it's always there, but they just don't have like access to it. It's just kind of frozen in their armor as well right it was I think this was the most consciousness that I've seen really suggested though that 
he kind of like it almost felt like you know when you're sleeping and you kind of half wake up and like like because a dog's barking or something like that and you're kind of conscious about it Mm -hmm. right but you're in that weird like like you can barely open your eyes and you just end up going back to sleep anyways and it's not until you wake up later that you're like is there a dog barking or something right like i felt like it was they're almost in that type of like i was a person I was a person and like all these things happen mm-hmm. but mm, that's gone now. Right. Kind of like almost like you know you try to remember a dream when you wake up and the more you try to remember it it slips away. Like yes. I had this great metaphor where they said, you know, trying to remember a dream is like catching water in your bare fingers. Yes. Cuz the harder you grab it, the more it just slips right through and that's what these guys kind of felt like like they're always in this dream state but they're trying to well, they're in a wake state, but when they were human, they were, that was a dream. And they're, you know, they're maybe they can maybe get glimpses of it and try to catch it, but they can't. Right. And frankly, that's terrifying. Like I keep saying that every time I think I have found the absolute worst way to die in the Warhammer 40k universe, they just keep on surprising me. <laughs> Amazing. Um, well, because I think we had talked about that with um, the most recent Uriel Ventress book, right? Where I was like, we have found like the most ignoble way to die, and the Necrons are eating somebody alive, and I'm like, there it is. That's that's it. That's the most ignoble way. Like every time I think I've heard the most horrific thing that can happen, <laughs> they really decide to detail. Kind Someone's of what like, these guys are going hold through. my beer. Pretty much, right? And then I was, which, granted, I know that this, again, this was published like nine years ago, so other people have known about this for a while. But it was one of those things when I read it, I was like, that's awful. I think the whole concept of the rub- rubric, the rubrics, or the rubric A are, is, is awful. It's just so... It's awful. It's so tragic, which is just, I mean, that's just the thousand suns. They're just incredibly tragic. They... They are. I make a lot of jokes about misery porn, but these guys are tragedy porn. Like, it just, again, but it, it, it is, it's kind of that, like, layering, like, oh, the rubrics are really sad, huh? Yeah. Did you know that they kind of have their conscience, but they just can't really get back any of their memories? Yeah. Like, oh, God, that's awful. So having read that, I kind of understood where Amon was coming from. Right when he's like, we just need to like slash and burn this. Okay, all right. I mean, this I, is all awful. I I can kind of understand. It's almost it's kind of the same. If you think about it, it's like the same goal that Ariman has. The planet of sorcerers is wrong, and that whole thing is just wrong. But his way, the only way to save it is to burn it all down. Like there is, he's basically there's no coming back from this. We have right. strayed way too far we have taken things way too far magnus has really messed things up for us like any hope of redemption magnus has ruined for us by creating this planet of sorcerers which is 100 percent true 100 percent true were you surprised by their their attitude toward magnus because i guess no really no and that's only because uh, Ariman was starting to feel that way at the end of A Thousand Suns. Like when he when he was at the planet planet of sorcerers, he was immediately like, "This is not okay. This is not right. Uh, we have lost all hope of ever finding out the truth and getting back into the Imperium's graces." You know, and because that was when he started writing. You know, in his book of Magnus that Magnus had given him so he could start kind of coming up with the way because he's watching everyone transform and mutate. And he was like, no, this is not right. So, I, so I'm not totally surprised. And I think anyone who had been a part of uh, Ariman's little cabal, like um, Amon, it kind of makes sense how they would kind of have that attitude. Like, no, he screwed us over. He has ruined everything for us. Right. Yeah, I I guess when you say it that way, it does make sense. I think one of the, th- again, it's kind of tropey, but it's a theme that I'm really liking and I really like seeing. 
is a lot of these chaos marines attitudes towards their their primarch their father and a lot of them have kind of realized that the emperor has no clothes right that these were deeply flawed beings Mm -hmm. and that it's interesting too because on one hand you have Amon, who has, like, dedicated his whole life to, look, we're just going to destroy it all. But then he's also talking about, like, you know, their father's folly and, you know, how he's done these things that are terribly wrong and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but you're trying to wipe out your entire legion, dude. And then you have Aramen, who's also looking like askance at Magnus and is like, yeah, this is all wrong. And I'm like, need I remind you what you did to the legion? And that you keep continuing to try to mess around with. Like, there's a, there's a level of hypocrisy there that I did I actually found interesting. And it no it's just to me it's just kind of the theme of the legion because this is what Magnus did to try to help and it made things worse. So Ariman's right. like, "Well, I'm going to help and it made things worse." And so, you know, Amon's like, "Well, I'm helping in my own way and that's definitely going to make things worse." But that's kind of my point. It's just these this constant need that it kind of goes with the whole idea of knowledge. Uh, with, you know, if we can just learn all of this, we'll be able to, to find an answer. The Thousand Sons are the epitome of the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Or in this case, the road to Zinch is paved with good intentions. Everything that they have done has been with good intentions and it has failed miserably. And the problem is they keep thinking they can try to fix it. So they try, I mean, at least I'll give them this. They don't try the same trick twice. Like, well, that one obviously failed. So let me try something new. And then, of course, that's going to fail. Well, I'm going to try something different. So at least I can't accuse them of insanity because they're not doing the same thing over and over again. That's, well, but I mean, like, at their heart are they? Because like Magnus right would get this like little voice in his head that would tell him like you should do this. You should trust that voice. Oh it was Zinch. Right? And then again that little voice in his head and he's like oh I should trust that. Oh it was Zinch. Again it's Charlie Brown. Like you keep trusting this inspiration or the voice in your head or this demon. But like Every time, especially with Aramen, right? Like, oh, I know I shouldn't trust this guy, but I really kind of am going to. Like, you keep trying to kick the football. Mm-hmm. But you know... So it's... You're right in that the... It presents itself differently, always. But at its heart, they're still turning to the sorcery, which I did... Like, this has not solved any of your problems, to be clear. And they keep going to it. And I guess maybe it's just because it's the only thing they know, right? Which is also adds to the tragedy of the Thousand Sons, right? It's like you've got one thing that you're real good at. And it's sorcery. <laughs> and yeah. it's doing you no favors. No. Because, again, you know, uh, you read a, the um, A Thousand Sons, Magnus gets wind that the word bearers are messing with Horus at the Council of Nicaea and instead of going to try to talk to his father or I don't know his other allies you know maybe talk to Sanguinius he's there he's on your side talk to him Sanguinius would have been by Horus' side like that and would have oh, stopped easily. it would have been like hey buddy what you doing what's going on yeah, exactly. Oh, Erebusir, I'm not talking to you, bitch. You can just go on out. I mean, he yeah. would have stopped. He would Nobody have... was talking to you, son. Yeah, I mean, but it also goes back to that um, hubris of, I can do it. I can take care of it myself. Did Arniman, like, ask anybody for help? No, he created this own rubric, this rubric himself. Didn't get anybody else's input because, again... I don't think anyone would have given him because he was the best sorcerer underneath Magnus, without a doubt. Right. And not only was he the best sorcerer, I think they all kind of, they do have that hubris of, I figured this out. Mm -hmm. I know, it's just going to work. It totally is. And I found it interesting that he kind of described it as being maybe a little naive 
And I was like, that's... Were you, though? Like, and I think it's just because I don't like the Thousand Sons and I don't like Araman that when he was like, you know, because... I did like when they flat out are like, uh, when the Oracle's like, why the, f why haven't you looked for death, by the way? Like, if you're so ashamed, why aren't you dead? Like, hundreds of people could have killed you over the years. Well, you know, maybe it's a little arrogance. Maybe it's naive. Like, the, mm, uh, so the way I, arrogance. the way I took that is going back to a thousand suns when Magnus had said, um, the wolves are coming and we must take our punishment and our fate. And our man was like, He's like, no, we're not standing up for this because he didn't fully grasp what was going on either. He just knew that, my gosh, my our dad has just said we're all going to die. Right. But then when you get to that point of death, like Magnus was totally going to stay up in his tower, let it all happen, welcome death with open arms. But it's a different thing to have that all in your head. And then when he's actually sensing his sons getting killed below, he's like, nope, I have to stop this now. Right. It's the same thing, I believe. It's the same thing that kind of gets gets passed on. It's like, it's one thing. Like, I think he would have welcomed death if it actually happened. But at the same time, that survival thing is so high with a thousand suns. It is. It really is. And yes, it is. So that's that also, I guess, makes Amon, Amon very interesting, right? <laughs> well, I don't think this he was going to kill himself. That was unclear, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure he was that. I mean, he was like the consummate politician. This is for everybody else. This is for the other people. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not right. for me. <laughs> like, this is the solution. I mean, obviously, it doesn't apply to me. No, because yeah, I came no, up I... with the solution. So, you know, just the, the line will just die with me as I just live on. And <laughs> right. Just continue to go on and do my thing. Mm -hmm. um, were you... So... In this book, this book, this is where this really reminded me of the Fabius Bile book, is that the first one was that, so Armin starts, Armin starts at a bit of a low point, right, with this denial of his power. In part one of the book, really until Tolbeck, and he kind of reveals himself, right, he reminded me of Perrin from the Wheel of Time series. Oh, that's your favorite character triggered um if i had the ability to talk to wolves i would be living in yellowstone as the queen of the wolves and the u.s government would have to parlay with me <laughs> like, i laugh no. but um i do the same to be right? honest yeah yeah so the fact that perrin spends 10 books slashing his wrists i don't want to talk to the wolves Dude. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, he kind of reminded me of that in the beginning, but he's just like, I have all this magical power, but no. It's like, bruh. It's bad, yes, but... You know what kind of reminded me of? Another character that drove me crazy in the early, early 1960s X-Men? Cyclops. I can't trust anybody because of the power of my eyes. No one can get close. Oh, shut up. There are so many of the X-Men who fell into that trap, though. Like, I have all this power. I can't be trusted to be around people. Yeah, but you're going to do it anyways. <laughs> like when he, he decides, like, I think it was because I have, like, the first, um, I guess it's kind of like an omnibus the 1960 stuff and the last issue in that he totally pushed like changing or not a thing but he totally pushes her away and she's just like i thought he cared about me what's going on and he basically tells it tells her that she needs to leave and get away from him go back home and have a life and then he's there like sobbing out the windows like because of the power of my eyes i can't be with her or be really close to anybody i'm like oh shut up are you kidding me right now? I mean... <laughs> Ouch. Oh, God. Sorry, Stanley, but um, it's a, it's also a type that, from the times, very much so, but most of the... Very much so. It's hard to go stuff. back and read a lot of those early arcs. Oh, my God. Because the early arcs, they're all over the place, for one thing, and they're also kind of tragedy porn, too. Where it's just oh, like, it's so traumatic. I mean, they make the blood angels look 
like they're in the middle of you know the importance of being earnest comedy (laughs) i'll put it that way pretty much (laughs) right like the drama is off the charts uh that actually extends well into the 80s too let's be real anyways (laughs) comic books everyone uh it's not a good parallel if you're getting compared to the x-men though especially not cyclops because i kind of hated early cyclops because i got so sick of the emo wrist slitting cyclops it's like man no wonder gene keeps breaking up with you you're depressing man you're just depressing but the fact that so you have this thing where armin no no and then well maybe i need to find out some stuff i don't know oh all my people are dead and then, like, it gets built up to make him into, like, okay, I got a ship, I got a crew, I got a new BFF. <laughs> Let's see how long that lasts. Um, I did, it kind of got me in the feels when Astraos is like, no, nah, I'm just going to paint my armor blue. I was like, oh, but also, maybe not. Like, it actually kind of made me sad reading Astraos slip into how Ariman operates which is I know is weird as someone who actually likes Ariman but I but I like him but I know I see him for what he is right. and you know Carmento is right about that he's going to be the death of all the mother I don't think they care so much because like they said they're now a chapter of three or no two right was it three because it's two now right because Thidius is gone Euthydius is gone. Yes, so it's just Caden and... And Caden's yeah. kind of... Maybe Caden? Question mark, question mark, question mark? Half of Caden. So it's like, you know, one and a half. And they never do say what chapter they are. Caden zero. And I kind of wanted to know. But they don't. And I wanted to know as well. I'm hoping that that like, gets delved into in one of the later books. Um, I'm going to assume I'm there's actually- some watered down chapter. I'm going to assume they're a successor chapter two, but like, I, and there's no shortage of successor <laughs> chapters that have gone renegade, right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm actually very interested in that. And I do hope that gets explored later because that'd be one of those things that I'd be like, oh, interesting. But I could also because see, there's... but I could also see John French not ever addressing it because in the grand scheme of things, what does it matter? Right? Like, I guess actually that's a good point, is that only if it's plot relevant. Mm-hmm. Like, if it's plot relevant, then yeah, tell me about the thing. But if it turns out to never be plot relevant, then... I still want to know. I'm just curious. Yeah, I just kind of want to know. Like, just mention it, like, in passing. But you're absolutely right. Actually, do you know what it reminded me a lot of? Was in Lords of Silence... Um, I can never remember this guy's name, but I really liked him. But it was the guy who he joined the Death Guard. He was not OG Death Guard. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And he talked about how joining the Death Guard was like slowly submerging in cold water. Mm-hmm. And how your body just kind of slowly but surely gets used to it. And it really reminded me of that. And I wonder if... I actually imagine that that's probably all of the Chaos Legion's arc, right? Where at first you're like, mm, no. And then you're like, well... I mean, this is okay, but otherwise, no. And you could just see Atreus, like, slowly but surely be like, this is fine. No, this is fine. This is fine, too. So on one hand, I liked at the end, like, when he's just like, nah, I'm going to hang out with you for a bit. Part of me is like, so you just saw that literally all of his friends are dead. <laughs> but, yeah, there was, on one hand, I was, that was cool, but on the other, there was a little bit of that disappointment, right, where you're like, is not the guy you want to be like no unfortunately no i mean that's fair you can like him while also knowing he is a cautionary tale (laughs) yeah he's not somebody he's not thank you he's not somebody that um you want to see how the story ends (laughs) you want to know about that from afar you don't want to right you don't want to go on the journey with him it's like the Facebook friend who, you know, is a train wreck and you're still friends with them. You don't really want to comment on any of their posts, but you just like knowing how they're doing. Or just watching that's the drama unfold. Pretty much. That's kind of how Armin is. Like, yeah. you'd like every now and then, like maybe every 10 years, you would go and check his feed and be like, well, look at that. He was at Cadia. Isn't that nice? But you don't. Oh, my God. So when they when, when they went to Cadia, 
I took me actually was like Katie is gone <laughs> like oh wait the before times this was yes this is the long long ago the before times <laughs> <laughs> Katie is still in one piece standing yeah I just had a moment of wait what oh right I actually okay it was a little I guess I'm starting to find the books that take place pre-rift a little refreshing when the world was simpler <laughs> it's like you don't have to worry about all of these things right so I did actually kind of like that too I thought that was fun um but I like you're right there are this they're just kind of this chapter of three and a half if you want to give what's her face credit Carmenta credit just being part of their cadre uh she's um, barely a and, thing anymore I mean pretty yeah like quasi literally um I did I liked that I liked that they're now off in this little group there but part of me was like okay well well, we knew that that's kind of where he was going to end up, though. Like, we knew he wasn't going to be throwing himself around the room for an eternity. Right. Right? Mm hmm Like, I think we knew that. Um, so where does he go from here, though? Well, that's the big question, right? Like, the, like I said earlier, like, this whole book has felt like it's just setting up the chessboard. Like, we're getting Armin out of his funk. He is going on a quest for answers he gets the answers the answers suck so what now what is right now that the chessboard is set up what's his next move and i mean i don't know when we're reading when we're reading the the next book but you know um sorcerer right uh yeah yes because the last one's unchanged i believe yes that sounds right um but I uh, hate to say this, though. I actually, uh, I did struggle with this book. And that's, like, I had a hard time keeping my attention with it. So I had to reread a lot of it. Because I'd be like, wait, how did they get there? Because <laughs> I just apparently just read and didn't comprehend any of it. It was just reading the words and not ingesting the words. And even then, there's some things I'm like, I still don't exactly know how they got there, but I don't care enough to find out exactly how that happened. One thing that's really interesting about this book, to me at least, is that, so we've read later John French stuff, right? Because mm -hmm. we've read his Inquisitor series. You can tell that this is one of his first books, that this is an older book. Like, you can yeah. tell. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's yeah. not one of its first, but you can tell it's much older. Mm-hmm. Because it's a little rawer. It's a little rougher on the edges. Um, he has a lot of phrase repetition and odd use of words. Where I would be like, oh, that's a weird one to use there. And not like in the not like in the weird flex but okay way of like sobriquet. Sobriquet. I thought it was sobriquet. Right? Like not in the sobri that was you're French. Totally right. Sobriquet. No, you're totally right, it is sobriquet. Um but like I was trying to like mm -hmm. again. I have a bad habit of trying to imagine how it's spelled, and then, anyways. Or my other so, favorite, uh, uh, Panoply. It's like that's how you. I love that one. It's just whatever it pops up. I'm like, okay, sure. <laughs> my favorite one is abattoir. I love that as a word because it's such a beautiful, fancy word for a fucking slaughterhouse. Um, <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> Um, but like it's not one of those like weird flex but okay words it's just the okay like and I can't think of an obviously I can't think of an example now that I'm talking about it but yeah there's a lot of stuff where I'm like this is one of your earlier works and it's actually kind of fun to go back and read some of the like it's fun to go back and read this now and see how he's evolved as an author mm -hmm. and it actually makes me not necessarily more excited for Sorcerer, but more excited for Unchanged because like, you get to see that progression, right? Which is actually one of the things that's really fun about reading the, the first Uriel Ventress Chronicles, right? You can see McNeil's, how he improves and stuff. I don't I know. I, I, I have to say, if my first book ever written would be Nightbringer, be the quality of Nightbringer, I mean... I'd be resting my laurels. Right. 
Right, because and I've said that before, like when I talk about the Gaunt's Ghost series, I have a really hard time recommending people getting into the Gaunt's Ghost series because, like, look, that first Gaunt's Ghost book is not good. It is one of Dan Abnett's very first books, and it is rough. Like, it feels like fan fiction rough. Oof. It is so bad. And the second book is not very good, and the third book parts of it are good but overall it's not very good mm -hmm. it's not until the fourth book where you're like oh well this guy can write and then you get into the fifth book and that's when you're like oh this is the dnf net that we know and then you go through there See, and beyond i wouldn't have gotten the past three books i wouldn't have gotten past the third book well it helps that do i have one right here no, I used to have like all the Gaunt's Ghost books like sitting here because we actually have the individual books. The first couple of books are like that thick; they're not very long. And the, I swear to God, the prints just a little bigger. Um, like I read, I think I read the first three of them in like three days. Okay, back before children. Um, oh, I remember be... those days, kind of. Yes, <laughs> remember when you just did like you wasted all of that free time that you had, right? Reading books and playing video games. And going um, to bars. And every movie that released, like literally every movie that came out. Like, do you guys want to go and see a French drama? Yes, I do. Friday night, of course I want to go see a French drama. Um, the movies that we used to go and watch. Anyways, um, like that's why it's like those books are really hard. So John French definitely starts on a much better footing than like Dan Abnett did, which is really funny about those books. Um, that was really fun. But Ultimately, I was kind of like, dude, just get to the chase. We know. Like, we know what Araman's doing. Everybody knows that Araman, and maybe it's because of Texas speech too, but everybody knows that he's going and looking for the Black Library. So could we, like, wrap it up? Get there. I get I get a little impatient with that, but you also know that I don't like prequels. And this felt a little prequely to him, well, for well, me at least. I mean, you can probably think that about any of the lore about established characters in Warhammer because it's been known he's looking for the Black Library because that's what's been established in the game, right? So it's always going to seem like ki kind of a prequel, whereas I personally kind of like this bridge of right. he's, you know, did the rubric, that did not go well, and now he's, you know, kind of trying to find himself. Just unfortunately, it's slow. It, um, like, when I perked up was when a uh, Carmenta called uh, Amon. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? Yeah, I was like, oh, okay. So that was what got your attention. Yeah. Okay. I was like, okay, well, now that this has got suddenly very interesting. And then I got through the rest of the book, you know, pretty quickly after that. Um, but when it got to the end, it's like, yeah, this was just a big setup for what his next thing is, thing is going to be. You know, and I don't mind reading how... Okay, yes, we know he gets to be, but I like I like finding out the steps along the way, as long as it's not, you know, the Horus Heresy steps along the way. Right. So, like, I liked, I liked, I loved Talon of Horus and Black Legion, right? Because I liked seeing those steps, and I liked seeing that. Because that was always kind of a big question, right, of, like, you go from having the Sons of Horus to the Black Legion. Mm -hmm. And so I really liked that exploration of it. And maybe it just could be because I'm not that invested in Araman. I'm not that invested in the Thousand Sons. That, and I think he'd be saying something very different if it was like another Legion. I that you I liked. honestly can't argue with you on that. Like if it was the World Eaters, or uh, you know, kind of going from like A to B about you know, right about Karn, his little transformation. Like I'd be like, like well, if it actually explored him becoming the Betrayer, right. Like, yeah. Yeah, like, that might be 100% up your alley, whereas I might be, eh, okay, whatever. That's true, actually. I think you... That really could be. And it's it's unfortunate, because I do feel bad. Again, because we read this after Fabulous Bill, there were just little themes in there that really just reminded me a lot of that series, right? Of, like, well, now we have to see is how he's gotten to where he is now, and... Here he is with his self-doubt and, like, finding himself and finding new friends. And I was like, oh, okay. But I think you're right. I think it's just because Araman... And I didn't like the people that he surrounded himself with. Like, 
Artarius was okay. He mm-hmm. was okay. I liked him. But he wasn't as interesting as... The, just for me, though. I liked Thidius. And that he like exited stage left. So, final question that I have to ask. Because this is probably the biggest... This was the one thing where I was like, What? What, what the hell is going on with Maroth? <laughs> I have no idea. Did you see that coming? No. No. So the whole thing with... Actually, the whole thing with Cater... I actually thought they forgot about him for a while. No. Until they were like, oh, release him! <laughs> release like, the Kraken. Oh, right. right, release the demon. I was like, oh, yeah, that guy. Um, I actually kind of thought that they forgot about him for a while. And so then... And then also, at the end of that battle, I was like, okay, all right, I guess... So yeah, the idea that why is Maroth even alive still? Like, why didn't they kill him? You know, uh, throughout the book, he kind of reminded it reminded me a lot of uh, gosh, I can't remember the character's name from Boardwalk Empire, and he was let's say he's a blonde guy. It doesn't help. That does not help. But well. uh, but when he picked up um, Steve Buscemi's brother basically hide him away because they he killed a FBI agent and uh, and that guy who picked him up he's like how are you still alive and I was like you know that's a damn good question he was Irish yes but yes and he dressed bad oh that's gonna drive me crazy but yes I know exactly who you're talking about now yes how that guy was still alive. Basically. After how many times he messed up. You know. And just, like betrayed and did all kinds of bad uh-huh, stuff. Uh-huh. And you know. Yeah. So and he's actually. But been, that was kind of a lump of sugar for him. Right. Where it was like. Why are you still alive? Still useful. Uh, but yeah. I mean. But it was actually because of him. That the brother was even getting investigated. Because of what his son did. Yes. Oh, I thought I had it for a second there. I can picture the actor, too. I mm-hmm. really like the actor. He's got a great grin. Like a big... Oh, my God. He had a big... Yes. He had, like, shit-eating grin. Like, yes, the he whole does. time. It's like a stereotypical Irish name, too. Like, Mickey. And here I was it's just thinking be- it was Dicky. Like, in my head, that's what I was thinking, but I don't think that was it. Mickey Doyle. So you were right, Mickey. Yeah. I'm like 90% certain. Somebody fact check me on that one. Um, Love that character. But you're absolutely right. Like with Maroth, the whole time I was like, why are you still alive? And you're not even useful. And then at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, So what do you make of this? I don't know. Uh, Other than a giant Xanatos gambit. Again, (laughs) it's so... Zijian. Yeah. It, I mean, it is. You know, and I don't think even uh, Ariman knew why he left him alive. Now, I found that whole thing very funny because Maroth had just been threatening him with, like, look at my power and look what I can do. And Ariman's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, just an hour later, he's snapping everyone out of existence and Maroth is now cowering behind the couch going, oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, and when he says, like, how when he reached into Maroth's mind, kind of broke him a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like, whoops. Or did it? Who knows? It might have improved him. Like, I can't tell. That was the other thing at the end of the book where I was like, was this guy just straight fronting this whole book? <laughs> it is like, okay, if I just pretend like I've, my mind's broken, we can continue to get along here and this plan will succeed. Siege is the very definition of the Xanatos gambit, or is yeah. Xanatos... It's entirely possible that David Xanatos was the first Zinchian? incarnation of Zinch. Yeah, which something about David Frakes voicing Zinch makes me very happy. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, the fact that like this whole thing is like, oh yes, it's all coming together. <laughs> See, now all I'm thinking is uh, Kronk. 
<laughs> Kronk. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, it's all coming. It's all together. coming together. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um. Yeah, that would it threw me for a loop there, and I guess and I maybe you're right because. I also kind of had trouble following parts of this book. So at the end when he was like, did our plan succeed? And I was like, you, you guys had a plan? There's always a worried. plan. There's always. Zinch is Seriously. involved in this. He's, He's playing plan. 40 chess with himself constantly. Um, like literally constantly. Um, you're probably right. But that was something that. I got there and was like, wait, did I miss something? I don't think I did, though. No, because I re reread that, like, several times. Oh, okay, good. And I good. was just like, because I kept thinking, I think I got distracted. And I was like, I think I got distracted again. And I just kept doing it like, no, I didn't miss anything. Which is exactly how Zinch wanted it. And that's true. So I'm, despite not liking this book, to one of your earlier points, despite not really liking it that much, I'm interested. Mm-hmm. I'm interested to see what the next book is. I don't know when we'll get to it because I do, I can tell you right now, I'm really glad that we broke this up because as sick as I was of Fabius Bile by the third book, I don't know that I would have made it to the third book in this one. Right. In one sitting. No, no. Mm -mm. So I'm glad we're breaking it up. I'm not super glad that we're breaking it up with Euro trash space vampires. Oh, come on. I'm curious about this one. It's Key Haley, right? Like, and the he Blood Angels. Off some more, and he writes also, the Blood Angels well. He does. And you guys, if you're wondering to yourself, self, why would a person who really doesn't like the Blood Angels at all purchase one of the limited editions? Have you seen this cover? Oh, right. Jen and my Rick God, colored pages. Y'all, I won't even apologize for that. <laughs> It is it's shiny. Good. Okay, the cover art is amazing, as is. Mm -hmm. The like etching that. in the back, yeah. Uh, uh, this whole thing is just 100% up my alley. Um, Maybe not the actual, what I think is going to be the actual cover the, art. The, yeah. No, not so much. Because that's kind of creepy. Like, this is like the stuff of mm. nightmares. Actually, this... It reminds me of like, I don't know, like a bad metal album from the <laughs> late eighties. Like, actually, I kind of had it. Low key, kind of reminds me. So the first time that I, this, my husband ruined this for me when he opened it. He was like, "Oh yeah, Meatloaf, Bad Out of Hell." I was gonna say Iron Maiden because that's what kind of reminded me of. But now that's just made it worse. Thanks, Jim. Because yeah. I hate Meatloaf. I never knew this about you. Overrated. I'm not apologizing. <laughs> I just grabbed my 70s plastic pearls. <laughs> How do we even continue doing this podcast? <laughs> um, I am. So on one hand, we're, we're sorry that we're doing a limited edition. I know this isn't available yet. And that I don't even remember how many copies there were of it. So 1200. Maybe, like, Oh God! Maybe all twelve hundred and fifty of you will decide to watch this. What read along with us, please? Um, sorry, but they're not publishing anything new right now. Like literally, nothing new is coming out. Although, <laughs> although they did tease us with God Blight, they did. They did, and I would like to let the record show when they said that they were releasing the new editions that have been the retconned timelines in them, and they're going to release special editions of them my husband looked at me and was like you are buying all of those that's when you're like well duh well no it's like no oh. <laughs> like i wasn't going to <laughs> it was really it was really exciting though because usually i show him my special editions and he's like it was really exciting the only problem but with that is like this is going to trigger my ocd something fierce because i already oh. have the first two limited editions all right, which I know that they're, they're not the retconned editions or the, I guess, the edited editions. But now I'm not going to get a third one like that because the third one's going to be like the other two. Right. So 
seriously, OCD is going to be seriously triggered. I, I think I think we're going to make it through together. I really do. I won't. I'll be silently screaming the whole time. Until eternity. You. <laughs> like, I, I, I got nothing for I you. I don't want one. to. This is what's going to happen. I mean, that's fair. That's fair. I have a few. I did not get the first Dark Imperium in Collector's Edition, so it kind of makes me sad when I look over and I see my second one in the Collector's that I'm like all by itself well, it's, um, it's kind of like you know I have uh, this second uh, covenant book is in a collector's edition because they didn't make one for the first so it's like just right. kind of hanging out by itself could y'all just do the thing yeah um, so I'm really excited for that I am excited that we'll have those um, I hate I hate doing the book where we're like some people will be able to get this in a year maybe uh, this is what Black Library has driven us to with their public mm-hmm. schedule currently it will be fun. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I am. Um, also, the black ribbon marker made like this. Is, this is this makes my '90s goth heart so happy. <laughs> like this book. Yeah, again, it makes my '90s goth heart happy. But definitely, right. I can't even add links to our post about where you can get the book because you can't get it anywhere right now. Yeah, God, good point. I didn't even think about that, but you're 100 percent right. So, TPD, thanks for bearing with us. After that, question mark, question mark, question mark. It's true. On that sad note, do you want to take us out, Carrie? Yeah, I guess so. God, Black Library, why are you doing this to us? But Why are you doing us dirty? I know, right? You've listened to the Warhammer 40k book club regarding Ariman Exile by... John French. Be sure to join us for our next book, Astaroth, Lord of Mercy by Guy Haley. We are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast on anywhere you get podcasts. Don't forget, we also have a Patreon where we offer two different tiers of content for your viewing and listening pleasure. You can learn more about that at patreon.com slash wh40k book club. Our site also has articles about our adventures in reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay well and read from a crack. Remember, I'm Alfarious people. That'll get you some chartreuse. Get you some goth. Actually, this is actually pretty chartreuse. That is pretty chartreuse. Mm-hmm. Get you some goth. No. No. This is gother than Chanel's vamp nail polish from the mid-90s. All right. Why don't you go shop at Hot Topic? <laughs> I will not go shop at Teen Ironic Boutique. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, just go there with your Anne Rice book. Chill, hang out. The witching hour is good. Back in the nineties, do not reread it. Ah, uh, Jen's gonna kill me first. Meatloaf and then hot topic jokes. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>